And so the effort for God to work is no longer there. Man is at work today. Man produces. You know, there is professional worship. There is professional music. There is professional preaching. Everything is on a professional level. But where is God in it? Because we have raised a society with a professional appetite. Oh, I like to go to this church. They have great music. They have a great place. They have a great speakers. We're not going to see the presence of God. We don't go to meet God. We just want to have professionalism. And so many churches spend millions of dollars a year just to pr produce professional services. And everything is you know, to the point. They practice, they memorize, and they do things, you know, like they have like a, a, a brainstorm sessions before Sunday with the staff, with those who are on the platform. They have to learn the lines. They have to learn what to say, how to say it, how to stand, how not to stand, and so. And everything like this is being orchestrated for a professional performance. The only problem is God is not in it. You go to these churches and spiritually you're going to be dead as long as you live. There's nothing there. So today I would like to talk about the move of God. The move of God. Because you see there is something about the move of God that is far more important to us than any kind of a professional status. Amen? And so now the Bible tells us here talks about three generations. It talks about you or yours. You know, they will be on your lips. They will be on your children's lips and your children's children's lips. So there's three different generations put together here in one passage. And God wants to communicate this morning to us something about generations. All right? So what is this all about? You remember... Ezekiel sees a vision, and then he declares, no, there is a river. And the river flows from the threshold of the temple. And the longer that river flows, the deeper it gets. It comes to the point where this river is no longer crossable. That is so much, so deep and so vast, so powerful, you know, that no one can cross that river anymore. The river takes control of everything that is in the river. And I was thinking about, that's a move. You know, it starts slow, it gets deeper, it gets more powerful, more powerful, and more powerful. And I was thinking about it. You now, we were once uh, uh, ministering in uh, Romania, but we had to fly into Budapest, Hungary, uh, and then from then we, we were driven by car uh, into Romania. And so, you know, I arrived in Budapest, and pastor came to pick me up, and we got in the car, and we were driving, just got out of the city, driving on the highway, realizing... On both sides of the highway, there's water. I said, what happened here? Oh, he says, we have just gone through major floods. Still there, but not as powerful, because before the highway was covered. You know, if I would come one day before, we could not pass the highway, because the water was about uh, 30 centimeters over, you know, the highway. But now finally, you know, the water subsided to, to the point where actually he could drive. We could go, you know, on. And so, you know, he, uh, he says, oh, you should see, it was terrible. There was this force of water just flowing and taking away everything that possible, you know, and just destroying houses, destroying fields, destroying everything in his path. And then I said to him, okay, suppose something happened. Where is the most safest place at, in the river? Probably in the shallow, right? Because there you can stand that's, that's the safest place. He said, no, 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 no. The safest place in the river is in the deep water of river. I said, what? Deep water? Why deep? He says, because in the shallow water, all the branches, all the debris, all the rubbish gets stuck, you know, and then it's being moved. You stand there, you know, they're going to cut your legs off, you know, they're going to uh, get you into the water, and uh, they can just cover you. It's not a good thing, you know. You cannot stand there because all the trash is going to ruin you. So you have to go into the water where there is no such thing, you know, disturbing you and getting into your way so that you no longer can stand, and that's danger to your life. 
I was thinking about that. And I thought, you know what? There's a lot of truth to that. A lot of people today, and we travel 40 countries or so, you know, and we see this. No, I'm not talking about, you know, a church. I'm talking about the church. A lot of people today in a church, they want to go to the church where there is a shallow water. Why? Because they think, you know, when you go to a place with a shallow water, there is no responsibility, there is no accountability, there is nothing. But you see, the problem is that in shallow water, all kinds of trash is gathering. Trash of teaching, trash of doctrines, trash of uh, practices, trash of all kinds of stuff. You know, and when you go to those churches, you realize you know, that sooner or later, that trash is going to take care of you. It's not a good thing to be in a shallow water. It's a good thing to get into the deep water. Hallelujah. And so, here, the insinuation of the text is, we are talking about three generations. So why are we talking about three generations? You see, when God purposes something, He always shows us that there is always a principle in what He does. And now in this case, there is a principle of God as to what He does when He wants to release His anointing, when He wants to release His blessing, when He wants to release a revival, when He wants to release a new move of God. There's always principles behind that. Unless we understand these principles, we will never get involved or receive or live those kind of uh, blessings of God that He has for you and I. And so we see here, it always starts with three. Why with three? You know, because that's the kind of a number that God uh, employs because there is Trinity. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? And so the Bible tells us, you know, from then on, many things are always in triad. Always three, three, and three, you know. So you have, uh, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have three, you know. You're talking about these things. You know, Jesus says, I'm the way. We just quoted today. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Three, why? Because you see, the mindset of man is such that you can easily remember the triads. Triads are always something you can remember. But when it comes to generations, it has nothing to do with memorization. It has something to do with the principles. I'm just going to read a few scriptures to show you how the Bible emphasizes those three generations throughout, you know, not the whole thing, but at least in some scriptures. Genesis chapter 45, verse 10. Genesis 45, verse 10, it says, You can live in the region of Goshen where you, that's uh, them, uh, can be near me with all your children and grandchildren. Three generations, your flocks and herds and everything you own. Okay, so it's talking about three generations. You, your children, and your grandchildren. Psalm 128, verse 6. May you live to enjoy your grandchildren or children's children, as it says in the Hebrew uh, Bible. Then uh, Proverbs 17, verse 6. Children's children are crowned to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. Proverbs, uh, no, Jeremiah 2, verse 9. Just give you a few scriptures so you can see that. No. And there they say, Jeremiah 2, 9, it says, Therefore I bring charges against you, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against you and children's children. Three generations, always three generations involved. Hosea, you know, talks about the revival, and he includes something here and says in chapter 6, verse 2, Hosea 6, verse 2, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that they, we may be, you know, coming into the living relationship and presence of God. Three days. Two days, and after the second day. On the third day, it's a third generation because here, you know, in Hosea, the time frame is always by days. One day is one generation. Three days are three generations. And so he talks about this. And he says, no, I'm going to restore you on the third day. Three days. Three generations. Why is God talking about generations? A third generation. What, what do they have important? You see, the thing is, when you look at the temple, 
You know, Solomon was uh, uh, dedicating the temple, and the dedication of the temple always comes in several different stages. You know, they had music, they had worship, you know, they had singers, you know, then they had presentations, and the last thing would be the prayer. And the prayer is very long. If you read, uh, you know, in Second Chronicles 6, you're going to see the prayer that was prayed before the dedication. It is incredible. It's a long prayer. But everything was prayed that was answered by God on the day of the dedication. And so, you know, there we see the fire fell at dedication. And when the fire fell and the glory of God moved in, everything else stops. The program was done, finished, and over with. Whatever was left, you know, from singers and uh, those who were doing all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, artistic things, it's all done. No one could do anymore because the glory of God came because of the fire. But there's an interesting progression, or now in this sense, regression of fire. Because first there was a great fire, then there's a lesser fire, and then there's a smaller fire. So it goes from great to lesser and small. Indication in three different levels as to how things work with God. And that is the picture of those generations that we are going to be talking about today. You see, when we go back, you know, into the covenant of Abraham, you would realize, you know, that God has not only intention to call Abraham out of his fatherland, out of idolatry, and bring him to a different country, into a different city to serve him. There's a purpose of God. Why Abraham? Could be anyone else. Why could not God choose someone else with a different name, with a different background, with a different history? But why Abraham? Because there's a purpose of God when God called Abraham. There's a purpose for you and I when God called us. He could have called a million other people in this city to become what you are today. But why did God chose you? Why did God spoke to you? Why did God brought you into a relationship with him? There's a purpose in your life. You are not only here to sit down, enjoy Sunday morning service, and go home, and then forget about it until next Sunday coming. You see, when God calls, He always gives us a purpose for our life. Because all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Not your purpose, His purpose. Every one of us is called according to his purpose. God placed purpose on your life when you came to meet Jesus Christ. There's a purpose for your life now. And you know, every person that is in the church needs to understand the purpose of God and needs to fulfill that purpose of God in their life to God. So we are not just attenders, we are not just visitors, we are not just participants of the service, but we are all called with a purpose to fulfill that purpose here in this church. And so Abraham was called. And I think I can't call him. But you see, with the call of God came some kind of a covenant understanding. And so God talked to Abraham, and he told him several things, what he wants to do with him and to him. And so we read in chapter 12, Genesis 12, we read there several verses, beginning in verse 2. You know, it says, I will make you a great nation. One of the first things God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Verse 2, I will bless you. You see, it was not Abraham seeking the blessing of God. It's God offering his blessing to Abraham. Many times now we come and we say, oh, God, bless me, bless me. Before you can say, God, bless me, he already says, I will bless you. Our God is a God of blessings. He wants to bestow his blessing upon his people. Regardless as to where we are spiritually, he says, I have committed myself when I called you that I'm going to bless you. That's God's commitment.